Hey, this is Greg Howe, and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Hi everyone, it's Rodrigo here, once again bringing you all the latest and greatest from the music world. Today I have the pleasure of catching up with a very influential, prolific and productive guitar player, Mr. Greg Howe. Greg, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Well, it's great to have you, and let me start by asking you. You're keeping busy with uh, online lessons these days, from what I heard, but uh, what other projects are you involved in? Well, I've been actually doing a lot of remote recording, a lot of people uh, kind of hiring me to do guitar parts on their, their albums and... Uh, did some stuff uh, with a guy named... I've actually worked a little bit with Simon Phillips, who produced uh, an album by a guy named David Wallerstein, who uh, has some really cool cool music coming out. So I did a lot of guitar work on that, as well as some video footage for, for some of the tracks. Um, I also redid a, um, a song that I had recorded a long time ago with Richie Kotzen <clears throat> called Tilt, which was actually the title track of the album called Tilt. Oh, wow. With a, yeah, with a guitar. Yeah, there's a guitar, a guitar player, a great guitarist, a young guy in China who just thought he, he loves that song. He thought it, it should be redone, and he wanted to do Richie's part. So uh, we collaborated on that, and um, that should be coming out soon. So uh, working on instructional content, finally, which is, you know, some of this downtime makes it a lot easier to do that because I'm not touring and, and being yeah. distracted. <laughs> um and uh of course actually you know working on my new album which was supposed to come out in august but now that i have a little more time i'm kind of revisiting some of the material and and uh you know taking a little bit more time with it so i'm 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 pretty busy and okay. then the student thing has been really going up because probably because uh you know people are home and they just are wondering what to do with themselves <laughs> yeah makes sense so, yeah yeah. You know. No, and, and speaking of the new album, uh, it was supposed to come uh, to be released around this time of the year, uh, but then you sort of revisited the material, right? What motivated that? Well, the main thing was that the tour, we had to postpone the tour till next year in the U.S. So mm -hmm. originally the tour was going to happen in August, but there were also some dates for other projects that I had in July. I was supposed to do this uh, summer camp thing up in uh, Oregon which was like a four or five day event, which was going to be fun in July. And then also I was supposed to do a summer camp in New York uh, towards the end of July, or maybe that one was towards the beginning. I don't remember. No, that's right. The one in New York was more towards the beginning of July. And that was, that was going to be really cool. Cause it was going to be uh, Paul Gilbert is actually his, he was really the main, uh, main guy, mm. but you know, Eric, Eric Gales, uh, George Lynch, um, who else? There's a bunch of other people that I'm going to forget, but um, you know, that alone was, going to be fun um and so that got postponed and then i was supposed to do another one in oregon so really i needed to have the album done before july mm -hmm. and so yes you're absolutely right i would the plan was to i was supposed to you know originally i was going to go out to california and track uh Stu ham and uh, joel taylor with the rhythm stuff um in april and uh, or, or i think may and then <clears throat> basically mix and finish you know tidy up any guitar parts between may and june and then and then have the artwork done and hopefully the plan was to release it by probably somewhere around this time of the year um but since we found out that the tour was going to be postponed till next year i just figured well let me go back and listen to some stuff because i was cramming you know i was trying to get it done pretty quick I see. Uh -huh. and i was i was happy with everything but you know there were some things i thought you know i can remember thinking that's cool you know if i had a little more time i might take a little more time on it but i i don't so i'm going to move on but now i do have more time so i'm going to re I, you know it's kind of nice to go back and go ah, i think i can upgrade this a little bit 
Right. Is there anything you can tell us about the material? I mean, is it a natural sequence to wheelhouse or do we have a name for the album at least? Or We don't. We have some. We don't. We don't actually yet. Um, we have some ideas thrown around, but I'm not going to in case we use one. I'm not going to I'm not going to mention any yet. Um, there's some ideas. I have a feeling that this album is going to be a little bit more bluesy, um, a little bit more in the direction of blues. I'm going to probably pull back a little bit from, uh, you know, the, the severe, uh, you know, unrelated chord changes and, and advanced harmony stuff and advanced rhythmic stuff. Right. Not that that's going to, it's not going to be void of that. Of course, there'll be, it'll be a Greg Howe album, but I, I, it's going to be aimed a little bit more at a, at a bluesy, maybe more st sort of stripped down feel to it. Okay. And is it a common thing for you? Like as, as soon as you lay down the tracks for, for an album, you sort of think, mm, maybe I should have done this or that differently or? Um, well, put it this way. I have recorded tracks where the next day I listen to it and I go, no, absolutely not. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is going to make the album. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, that has happened. But when I make a decision to finally, when, w once I know for sure that something's going to make the record, it's generally because I do feel good about it. Okay. And so well, I, for one, I'm glad that you're narrowing the gap between albums because from Soundproof to Wheelhouse, it was almost 10 years, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It was, it was a long time. At yeah. least, but we did have the, the band album. I I'd put, you know, briefly put a band together called Marigold. So that was at least something in between. But you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. I need to narrow that gap moving forward from here on. And, yeah. and I will, I promise everybody who's listening. Good <laughs> stuff. Good stuff. I'm glad to hear yeah. that. <laughs> Well, yes. speaking of Marigold, uh, I still listen to that album quite regularly. Uh, was there ever a chance of a follow-up or maybe touring with that band? What happened there? Well, it's, it's one of those situations where you have a lot of talented people and mm -hmm. um, coming from different worlds. I mean, when I say different worlds, um, you know, uh, the bass player and the singer were both um, playing in cover bands on the East Coast and um, really hadn't been in this in the world of, you know, recording artist world. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different thing. And there were just a lot of ideas that, uh, that we had that we, that we were hard for us to all meet in agreement on. And, you know, to, to make a long story short, we just kind of didn't, uh, we just didn't see eye to eye on, on, on so many things that finally it was just became un uncomfortable and, and, you know, quite frankly, unpleasant to work to mm -hmm. keep working together. You know, for me, I just want to have a good time. You know, my whole thing is if, if music isn't fun, then people can kind of indirectly and sort of supernaturally detect that. Mm -hmm. It's got to be fun. We have to be having fun. We have to like each other. We have to, you know, because then there's a real chemistry and there's a real vibe. And, and then you don't really care that much about whether or not things are super successful or not, because you're just having a good time. The whole point yeah. is to have a good time. So, um, Yeah, I just finally when it started to when it started to become just not fun anymore, I just decided I think we should probably go our separate ways. And we made a great album. I feel really good about the album. Uh, there, every you know, I feel good about everybody in the band. You know, now that we're not married anymore, you know, <laughs> you know how it is. Sometimes people get divorced and then they get along with each other. So yeah, that's that's kind of how it is with us. You know? I understand. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, a few years ago, you were supposed to join a, ba a band called Moshulu with David Sanchez, Jeff, Jeff Berlin, Dennis Chambers. Uh, mm -hmm. Did that uh, actually happen, or? No, I, I I ended up having to. I, I there were again. It was one of those situations where, uh, you know, Jeff Jeff was pretty much at the helm of that, so it was mm -hmm. his baby, and um, it seemed like super exciting. I mean, I've played with Dennis many times, and I love Dennis. Uh, you, you know, you can't not like. You can't not love playing with him. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was excited to play with David Sanchez because I'd never played with him and I, I'd heard him and um, really didn't know much about his prior uh, sort of instrumental recording career. I knew of him from like the Sting, Ten Sting. Thunders Tales album. Yeah. 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 But then I started going back and listening to stuff and I'm like, oh, okay, this guy's really great and amazing. So this, this should be fun, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, it was a situation that once... Um, once I started to understand what it was, which was that Jeff really had his own vision about what it was going to be musically. And that vision was not, was so different than what I had pictured. You know, to me, I just pictured mm -hmm. we're all going to get together, have some really play some, some great songs that, that crowd would love. Um, everybody would submit 
two or three of their own songs and we just go out and, and tour it. But when I submitted my stuff, um, Jeff was kind of like, yeah, no, I don't really want to do that. I want to, <laughs> you know, he, he, he had his vision was a lot more jazz, like very straight ahead. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm not really that guy. I mean, I could probably mm-hmm. fake my way through it and do okay, but I'm, you know, if, you know, if, if, if he knows my playing, he knows uh, to me, I'm, uh, I would have just said, well, then you should hire a jazz guitar player, you know, hi- hire, uh, you know john schofield or somebody like that but um so yeah i just i've kind of backed out of that myself yeah no i think that's what happened in the end because if you listen to what they actually released or what they played live is pure jazz you're right in that song. right yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i think that's where he wanted to. so if he'd have said that to me in the very beginning i probably would have said okay well that sounds like a great idea but i'm probably not your guy mm-hmm. um, yeah but i didn't really know that that was his vision until after i had sort of said yes so i felt bad having to say Oh, mm. now that I know what it is, I think I'm going to pull out. Okay. But, but that's how that went down. Yeah. Well, at this stage in your career, I think you feel more comfortable uh, being a solo artist as opposed to being a band, except for Protocol, right? Oh, Protocol's a blast. I mean, yeah. gosh, that's just so much fun. I mean, it's challenging. It's a it's, it's fun challenge. Um, but what was really cool about Protocol was that when Simon originally sent me the material that he had in demo form prior to us recording that fourth album... Mm. It was so, there was something about the music that actually really reminded me of stuff that I, I write. You know, it, it had a feel to it that was very, almost like, wow, this feels like a song that I could picture myself having written, or, or at least similar, you know, especially uh, some of my earlier stuff in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And, and so it seemed, I seemed really, it felt really at home. It felt like it was just a door that was waiting for me to step into it. Um, and then when I found out who was going to be playing, I was really excited about it. So that, that was just a blast. Um, I love playing with Simon. He's, he's amazing. Um, he's really creative. He's a, a super drummer, a super producer. Uh, he's, he's, he's got a great vision, a great ears. And, and there's something about his creative uh, impulse that, that's, that, I, that I align with. You know, I'm, synced, I'm synced up with him somehow. <laughs> Right. Well, I interviewed him like 10 months ago, and I spoke with mm-hmm. a lot of guys that he produced. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think it's unanimous how great this guy is. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, indeed. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. Well, through these years, I think you toured a lot. And I actually saw you here for the first time, or here in Toronto, where I am, uh, in 2017. Okay. Uh, right. Right. Uh, I do remember you playing a, a cover of Alan Holdsworth's uh, Protocosmos, which you covered on yeah. the Extraction album, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you still go to Alan for inspiration these days, or what do you, where do you go for inspiration, for example? <laughs> <laughs> what a good question. Uh, everywhere, uh, honestly. I, be, I'm all over the place because I love, I just love great musicianship, and I love great music. So it's not, um, there isn't any particular genre or format uh, that I that I that I follow. I mean, I, I'll listen to. I'll spend a, four hours just listening to Chick Corea, mm. or uh, or a great bass player. You know, um, I'll listen to these some of these newer guys, blues guys like Kingfish, or uh, you know, I love Eric Gales. But then you know, I'm the guy, and I've always been this way. I'll listen to Eric Gales for a couple of days, and then it's like I'll get in a Holdsworth kick or a Pat Metheny kick, and I'm just, mm-hmm. you know, or, or I'll listen to some sax player, you know, for a while. So I, I just uh, I bounce around because it's all inspiring and and I like to I like the idea of being influenced by stuff that's kind of off the beaten path for me. In other words, uncharted territory for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, inspiration always comes from uncharted territory for me. It does, <clears throat> I, I, I'm jealous almost of uh, artists who have found their niche. Um, and who will put out albums that to my ears kind of sound similar over and over again. <laughs> but, yeah. but to me, it's like, well, if they feel good about it, then that's great. And that, that must be really comfortable to not feel the need to expand or to evolve beyond that. But for me, I'm not satisfied and I'm not inspired if I don't feel like I'm evolving. And that doesn't mean necessarily getting better. It just means evolving to some different place than right. when I was the previous year it's a blessing and a curse right because you right. don't settle exactly. with anything <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah and i think when you started playing uh everyone wanted to be eddie van helen and you did have a lot of his style for example in your band howie too when did jazz and fusion come into play as an influence of yours 
Well, you know, I would say that when we recorded that first album, which was in, I think, 89 at this oh point. Gosh, it's that long ago. My <laughs> gosh. Um, <laughs> even by then, I had already been listening to a lot of guys. I was way into Scott Henderson back then. I was, uh, and through him, I sort of discovered Schofield. I had gone through a big Pat Metheny phase. I was listening to stuff. And you have to try to take into consideration that I that we were on a on a label that at that time really was exclusively a heavy metal label. Mm. So there were certain things and certain guitar vocabulary that I knew I had to kind of keep under wraps because they weren't going to be appropriate or they wouldn't have been as appropriate in that setting. And so I, even though I was listening to a lot of that stuff and I was evolving, um, some of it wasn't, some of it would not have been detected uh, on, on those uh, how to albums. Mm -hmm. So when, by the and, and I was evolving. And so by the time Introspection came out, Mike Varney's label had expanded quite a bit. He had the blues thing going on. He was doing some fusion stuff. He was not exclusively heavy metal by 1993, mm -hmm. and that was the that was the year that I got to, for the first time, record my own album at home. So, the record contract uh, was written in a way that enabled me to be compensated with some studio equipment as, as well as some money. But I mean, we, we had a different kind of arrangement where I wasn't going to be flown out to California to record. So I, I had free reign to kind of do whatever I wanted. And, and that was, that kind of felt like the first time that I got to really just express my true self um, and just make music the way that I would make it if I was uh, not being watched over by anyone and i was a little nervous when it was done and i had to submit it to mike because i i was mm. wondering if he was going to call me back and say this is way too jazzy i can't put this on my label i, I what is this greg I, this, I need some i need some aggressive guitar in your face I, I need something so i was worried a little bit but but he liked it and um yeah. and I'm, I'm glad he did because i think I, that's that's an album that i i definitely feel good about and, and i had some great players on it kevin safara played drums and a good friend of mine, Al Caldwell, played bass, who I still talk to today. Mm. And um, yeah, so uh, I, I was listening to a lot of stuff it, it, behind the scenes. And, and some of the evolution that sounds very immediate wasn't as, quite as immediate as, it, as, the, as the perception of, of that was. I understand. Well, yeah, that, that would be my follow-up question. If there was ever a concern from Shrapnel that this was not the market they were going for, you know, we want shredding, we want uh, Marty Friedman, right. and, you know, Malmsteen right. in your face kind of stuff. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was a little concern. But, mm -hmm. you know, part of the, one of the things that I, I remember thinking around that time frame was that, you know, when you listen to so many of these amazing guitar players that Mike had discovered, you know, from Paul Gilbert to Vinnie Moore and, and Tony McAlpine and, and uh, you know, Yngwie and all, all these guys, and, you know, Jason Becker, I knew that there really wasn't much from a technical place that I was going to be able to do that was going to set me apart. I wasn't going to, you know, I'm not, you're not going to outdo Paul Gilbert from, on, on a chops level. It's mm. just that's about as intense as it gets. And my thing was, not that I'm trying to outdo anyone, but if I'm going to be heard and if I'm going to be noticed my expansion has to come in a different direction. And so the direction was more in the terms of composition and um, genre. And, I, and, and my feeling always, even from the time I was young and, and developing, was every time I would hear an Yngwie type player, I'd always think to myself, that's amazing technical virtuosity. How come I never hear that level of technique or that level of virtuosity when I'm listening to music that I prefer, like say a Schofield, you know, right? Mm. Or, or, so I always thought, wouldn't it be great to have the energy of rock players, but sort, of, but but at least have some of the sophistication and some of the sort of um, demeanor, if you will, of of jazz players or fusion guys. And I always had a vision of, of of melting that together somehow. So introspection felt like the first time I had an opportunity to at least toy around with that concept mm. i think that transpires also in your personality because typically guitar heroes tend to have like <laughs> a certain arrogance a certain demeanor <laughs> in their attitude but uh, you're a very down-to-earth kind of guy right i don't know if it's a fair comment or not but 
Yeah, I don't really understand. I, I mean, I've heard people say that before, even though I've met a lot of great players um, who, are, who seem to be very nice guys mm -hmm. to me. Maybe they're only that way to me because <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. But um, I never really understood the correlation between being talented, therefore I have a license to be cocky. I don't, I, that <laughs> never made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> I just yeah. don't understand it. Uh, to me, it's like, I'm very grateful that there are a bunch of people out there that enjoy listening to me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's a blessing. That's not, to me, that's a blessing. So I'm, I'm very grateful of that. I'm not, I don't, I don't know where the, uh, I don't know where the, where the, the license <laughs> for, <laughs> to be arrogant comes yeah. from. I don't, I, I've never applied for that. Right. And I asked Vinny more this question, and I'll, I'll ask you, was there a sense of competition between the artists of Shrapnel at the time, or more of a sense of camaraderie, or what would you say the overall attitude was? For me, I think it was com camaraderie. I mean, mm -hmm. there was a lot of respect amongst everybody. And, uh, but at the same time, um, listening to guys and thinking, oh my God, I got to be able to do something that sounds like, I got to, he's doing that? I, I, I got to come <laughs> up with my own thing. <laughs> you know, so there was, it's more inspiration, more like, uh, more like you're being uh, pulled up. Challenged. You're, you're, you're yeah. being, mm -hmm. yeah, you're being challenged in a positive way to just say like, hey man, I think you can do, th I remember playing with Jason Becker for the first time and just seeing some of this incredible technique right in front of me. And he was so um, generous and willing to just say, oh, no, all you got to do is this. All I'm doing is this right here. Uh -huh. This is not. And then he would turn around and go, oh, what did you, what'd you do there? Oh, what was that? That was so cool. So there was really a more of a childlike fascination with each other, I think, more nice. so than com competition. Uh -huh. Well, the most recent song I heard you play was actually on the Jason Becker album, the Valley of Fire song, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. What was it like to record that song, especially knowing Jason's life story and, you know, the thing that he's going through? Oh, man, it's always, you know, Jason is close to my heart because he's, mm -hmm. we're, we're really good friends. And even though I haven't talked to him in probably a year now, I need to, I need to go, I need to go visit him, if I, you know, or at least give him a call and talk to him. But no, it's always great to do whatever I can. Um, if I can contribute in any way to him, Uh, it feels good because he was such a big part of of my upgrade as a guitar player. He, he really was. Um, when you know, when I went out to Shrapnel for the first time and to record my first album, I, I'll never forget. I was listening to Mike Varney had a tape playing in this car, and it was and it was at a low volume, and I just kept hearing this ridiculously <laughs> impressive guitar playing. <laughs> this ridiculous stuff, you know, just blah, 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 yeah. arpeggios everywhere. And I finally, I said, who is that? And he said, oh, that's Jason Becker. He's working with Marty Friedman. And they're going to be recording in the studio while you're there. And I got so scared. I remember wow. thinking, no, please, no, no, it can't, don't, no. <laughs> But then when I met them, they were both so cool. And, uh, and uh, Jason and I got to hang out quite a bit because Jason lived near there. So mm -hmm. we did a lot of jamming together. And, um, and it was just great. So, yeah, anytime I have an opportunity to do anything to contribute to his, uh, his cause, it, 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 I feel honored. It feels great. Nice. Uh, let me ask you about the, uh, the neoclassical style, because you did an album in that vein called Ascent, uh, and I've, yeah. I've seen some comments you made about how difficult the, the making of that album was. And yeah. I, th I think it's always uh, something unusual, because the fans seem to love that album. But what was difficult about it? Well, it was, it was so far out of my comfort zone in terms of its genre and it, you know here's the ironic thing about it so this is the irony and one of the i took a big lesson from that mm. story which is that i never again uh, since then have i ever i've you know i've always said to people don't make decisions don't make career decisions based on money make career decisions based on what you love to do be be honest with yourself be sincere mm -hmm. because it will likely backfire <clears throat> and it did so i had re produced an album by this uh, keyboard player named Vitaly Kupri in 1998. And he's sort of like a neoclassical, he's like a keyboard Ingve, right? Yeah, so, from our tension, right? Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. exactly. Uh -huh. So his music is very, you know, uh, classical in a heavy metal vein. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got all the fast runs and the diminished stuff and all that. So I was originally, when Mike t asked me if I wanted to be involved in that album, it was supposed to be, some 
some amazing guitar player, I think Czechoslovakia or somewhere, some Eastern European country that supposedly was like Paul Gilbert meets Ingve kind of guy. Hmm. And then there was supposed to be some amazing bass player. And I was going to be producing it. I was going to be sitting behind the mixing console. I was going to be the guy just kind of overseeing it. I was, I was excited to take mm. that, you know, to step into that role. Um, but in typical, uh, you know, unexpected fashion that, you know, in this, in this industry, turns out the guitar player can't do it. And then the, the bass player can't do it. So I end up playing guitar, all the guitar parts and bass wow. on the songs <laughs> of, of, uh, of, of, of Vitaly's and mm. and I felt the need to really step into that to that genre authentically so I had to really dive into it and you know really get into that mindset of of that kind of music even though it's really not where my heart lives I'm not mm -hmm. really into that but the album did so well in Japan especially that um, when I started to talk to some of the labels from Japan and Mike was dealing with them, uh, they said, we, would, we didn't know you could play like this, you know, and uh, we would love it. <laughs> we would love if you would put your own album out like this, and maybe you could have Vitaly on it, and we could have essentially a second version of that, but with your material, and, and in exchange for that, it's, so my thing was, okay, well, it's not really my cup of tea, but, you know, if we can talk about money, then if you guys are going to offer something really, really cool, mm -hmm. um, then maybe I'll consider it. So, so there was much bigger money on the table in terms of their offer, um, all of which fell through. None of it happened. Oh. So <laughs> I ended up really, you know, and I was practicing a lot to get that, those kinds of chops and, and, get, get, and get into that mindset. But the irony here is that um, it, it all worked out finally. They did end up taking the album. But at one point, you know, I sort of had a, a brief falling out with Mike Varney because uh, Vitaly was under some different kind of contract where he wasn't really supposed to be able to record with me mm. without Mike's permission, even though he did. Then Mike found out, and uh, long Jesus. story. <laughs> but but isn't it interesting that one of the most difficult albums I've ever recorded was really the closest thing to selling out I ever did? It's like most <laughs> people sell <laughs> most people sell out by playing some cheesy music. I had I I kind of sold out by uh, pl uh, you know playing in this this genre. Uh, that was way more difficult than, than oh, yeah. I preferred to play. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Most difficult road ever for selling out. Yeah. <laughs> Pre pretty, yeah. exactly. That's exactly what it is. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, th I found it funny how on the follow up uh, album, I think it was Hyperacuity. The impression I get right. is that you wanted to make it clear <laughs> yes. no, that's not me. You know, this is who I am. Right. <laughs> that's exactly how I was thinking. I remember <laughs> that specifically. I remember thinking, I, I need to put something out that really reinforces the notion to all my fans that I am not going down that road. I am not going down the neoclassical road. That's not what I do. That's not happening. So, I, yeah, I think it, it ended up being so far the other direction that it, it actually <laughs> is kind of a weird album, right? It's almost a very odd, experimental sounding yeah. uh, album. <clears throat> well, but you but, got yeah. your point across, <laughs> for sure. Yes, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and you play with uh, some of the biggest names in pop, like Enrique Iglesias and Sync, Michael Jackson. Maybe yeah. those weren't challenging gigs from a musical standpoint, but production-wise, uh, I think there was a lot to adapt to, right, in terms of choreography, Absolutely. effects. Tell me about that experience. Well, you know, one of the things that people, uh, especially guys that are in, you know, the genre that I tend to be in, when I say that, I mean that are doing complex music, uh, there's, a th there's a thought I think sometimes amongst some people that if you're playing pop music, it's easy. Mm. But uh, that's that's like saying if you're playing blues, it's easy. It, it's easy if you're playing easy licks. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you can blues can be as complex as you want it to be. And you can address chords. You can you can address them with altered scales. You can address them chord by chord. You know, playing dominant stuff per chord. You know, address all the secondary dominance. You you can make it as complicated as you want. And the thing about these bands is that they're all, all top-notch musicians. And it's one thing to play an, an easy song, but it's another thing to play an easy song and make it sound really pro, where, you know, you're really locked in. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned so much from standing next to the rhythm guitar player, uh, David Williams, in the uh, Michael Jackson band. I nev I'll never forget the first time I played with him, because I, I stood right next to him, so his amp was right next to mine. Mm -hmm. 
And just listening to his rhythm and how in the pocket it was that it, I mean, so much so that like, I, you know, I'd get my, the hair on my arms would stand up. Like I didn't, <laughs> I never knew you, that rhythm guitar could be an actual art form. And, uh, so there's a different kind of thing that you learn amongst these guys. Cause a lot of these guys are capable of doing the type of music that I'm playing, but they're just not doing it, but yeah. you can he but you can sense, you know, that level of virtuosity, even when they're playing simple things, there's, there are certain subtle ways that they, that they play that, that although it might be an easy part, they're, they're making the best of the best version of that, that it, it can be. It's very hard to explain, but mm -hmm. it was a great learning experience, you know, uh, having, you know, the, the marriage between the bass player and the drummer, that kick drum and that bass player, just understanding the importance of it, of that precision and how much bigger something simple can sound mm. when it's done that way. So it, it was right. a great learning experience. And there was a lot of other things that you learn about professionalism and, you know, what is, you have to be, you know, conducting yourself correctly on a tour bus for long -term periods of time and um, you know, making sure you make the lobby call every morning and not partying too much the night before. Mm. You know, you have to, you know, you, you learn about responsibility, you learn about, um, you know, just respect for the organization. So, it was right. great. Right. Uh, I'm curious about the theatric side of things. Uh, did you learn anything from working <laughs> with Michael Jackson, for example? Uh, were you able to incorporate something in your performance? Or <laughs> I don't know that. I, <laughs> that's a good. That's a good one. Because I actually, I what I did have to. You know, when I when I got up with, I found out that really the only musician in that band mm. that really interacted with Michael was the lead guitar player. So Jennifer Batten was the only one who ever had to leave her station and get out there and start having to do things. Mm -hmm. And it was quite a bit, to be honest with you. Uh, lots of interacting with him, interacting with the dancers, lots of, you know, stepping up and having some fan blow on you and, uh, you know, spin around when the doctors, uh, when the dancers walk by you. Um, I had to, there was a lot of stuff I had to interact with him. That, but I, but if you're asking whether or not I took any of that with me, I don't know that I really did. I mean, I haven't put a, that type of band together that, where... Uh, uh, choreography has been that much of an issue. Uh -huh. Not that I'm opposed to that, because I, I always I have a vision of a great band that would that would not only be doing this great stuff on stage, but that would also incorporate some some level of theatrics or some level of just some visual stuff that might be really cool. So, who knows? Maybe yeah. it's yet to it's yet to happen. Yeah, well, I'm asking because if you look at Steve Vai, for example, after he worked with David Lee Roth, his show was completely mm. different, right? His attitude on mm. stage, everything. He, like, he seems yeah. to have learned a lot with White Snake and, and David Lee Roth. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 and 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 and, and, and uh, you know, and, and I think that's that's a great that's a great uh, idea, uh, um, and it's a good question because it is something I've actually thought about. It just in this world, for whatever reason, it just seems that. Um, when, a, when I'm going to put a, a band together or a tour together, um, it always ends up being a situation where you got these great musicians, but you only have like three days of rehearsal before a tour. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you send them the material, they learn it, you get together, you rehearse for two or three days. And it really never seems to be enough time to actually implement those types of things into a show. But in the right situation, I think I would not only not be opposed to it, I think it would be something I would, I would, I would actually encourage. And I think if Marigold had kept going, we, we definitely would have had some of that. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Maybe someday. <laughs> Maybe. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. But uh, speaking of collaborations, uh, you mentioned Tilt, uh, the album that mm -hmm. you did with Richard Cotson. He did another one, uh, and those were like a guitar player's dream, those two albums. Was right. there ever a chance of you guys doing shows together or doing a third album? Is that still in the works? Because I know you guys are still good friends, right? Yeah, but I, you know, Richie is um, Richie's very much into his. You know, he's a full on, full blown artist, singer songwriter, um, guitar players. So, and I think he really enjoys singing. I think it, he, it's something that's really close to him. It's mm -hmm. uh, I don't I, I don't think that. I just get the sense, not that we've ever had a direct conversation about it, but I just get the sense that he's not really that interested in, uh, you know, blowing people's minds with guitar playing mm -hmm. as his core, 
as his core premise as of an artist. I think he he's you know he vocals and songwriting and lyrics and performing are really his thing. And he's so talented that um, you know even with him not trying to be the greatest guitarist in the world, he's still one of the greatest guitarists in the world. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I think it doesn't really. I just get the sense that it wouldn't be that interesting to him unless maybe at some point he just kind of got bored with what he was doing and wanted to, uh, you know, take a departure for six months. And I could picture him calling me maybe in some random way and saying, Hey, you know, I've been getting all hit up about these tilt album and how about we go out and do something? So that it's a possibility, but I've never heard him say anything to indicate that anytime in the near future, that seems like it would, you know, something he wants to do. I understand. Right. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your uh, composition style and how you find the balance between shredding and writing something catchy that will appeal to non-guitar players? Because Tilt was the opposite of that, right? It was guitar, guitar, guitar. It right? was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just guitar. It was really <laughs> just, here's a lot of guitar for you guys. <laughs> uh, but, but generally speaking, composition is by far the first thing for me. So um, I tend to listen to a lot I, I would never show a, a fan my MP3 collection because it's almost 80 to 88 to 91 percent guilty pleasures. It's, it's some <laughs> of the corniest, cheesiest stuff, but I love it because it's hooky, right? So the the hook is really big for me. You know, it's something that's I want I want it to be memorable. I want it to mean something. I want it to I want it, I want it to I want you to remember the song as being something that you could hum along to, not just not just remember the guitar solo. So um, the guitar soloing is always the very last consideration. It's the least, almost the least important thing to me when it comes to putting an album together. Um, it's the compositions mean a lot to me. I, I, I don't just put songs together as an excuse to shred over. I put songs together that I, that in my mind would, would hold up on their own, even if I, walked off stage mm -hmm. so that that's always been my thing the song is way more important the music is the thing guitar as much as i love it is a distant second to music so in other words if for whatever reason guitar playing was outlawed in the world <laughs> um i would still be very very much just as much involved in music in some other capacity i mean the, the creative process is what i live for so The compositions always come first. When I'm when I'm writing a song, I'm not thinking about soloing. I'm not thinking about anything other than if I wasn't a musician and I wanted to hear something that made me go, ah, I like this, what would that sound like? And so mm -hmm. that's how I start. That's where it begins. It starts with I'm not I'm not playing music for guitar players. I'm writing music for for imaginary people that would wouldn't know an arpeggio from a hole in the ground. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm not aware of music theory at all, and I'm a fan, so I guess you kind of accomplished that. I can say that. That's myself. great. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. That makes me feel good. Yeah. And from seeing you live, I get the sense that you don't try to play exactly like the albums uh, that you recorded. No. You, you just let the notes flow organically, all. right? I really try to. There are, in some instances, when it comes to a song like, say, Jumpstart, or uh, maybe a couple other songs, There are certain solos that I will thematically keep very similar because for two reasons. Number one, the chord changes might be so complex that I don't feel like having to think that much on stage. So I kind of have my own, I kind of have a strategy that, uh, that makes it sort of sound very similar each night. But for the most part, you know, most of the songs, I, uh, Yeah, I just wing it and go for it and, and say to myself, yeah, let's see what happens. Sometimes it doesn't happen the way I wish, but yeah. it, the, the thrill of going for it is still worth it to me. Wow, that's quite a quote. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll use that for the headline, maybe. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, how come you never did one of those G3 tours? Were you never invited? Was, was there a conflict of schedule? Because you, you would fit the bill perfectly, right? Uh, well, you know, if you ever uh, interview Joe Satriani, um, <laughs> you could ask him. I, I've run into him many times. He's a good guy. I've, he's, he's kind of a friend, and uh, I've seen him at various times. And every time I see him, he's like, hey, man, we got to get you out on G3. And I'm like, yeah, well, you got my number. So <laughs> uh, It's really going to have to be up to them. I don't know. I, 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 to me, it feels like it would be an ideal. Yeah. Uh, fit, you know, 
it seems like it would be really cool. Yeah. But I don't know. Uh, it's really not a question that I could personally answer. I would love to do it. Just so if you're listening, Joe, yeah. but I, you know, I'm here. <laughs> let's make it happen. Maybe there's a yeah, petition or I don't know what it takes, but uh, I think it would fit the bill for sure. <laughs> I think yeah. so. I think yeah. it could be really cool because, yeah. because he's a great player and his, his style is so much different than mine. So to me, that's what makes it even cooler. You know, like yeah. you got three guys up on stage. Everybody's got their own thing. It's you got three different, distinctly different sounds. And uh, yeah, I, I feel like. Yeah, I feel like I would qualify, but uh, who knows? <laughs> it was. It was. Uh, uh, tell me about the partnership between you and DV Mark. Uh, you're not only a client; you also help them develop their amps and other tools uh, with a hands-on kind of approach, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that's the greatest company I've ever worked for. They, it's uh, it's like a big family. It really, really, truly is. I you know, and I, I know it sounds corny and cliche, but it really <laughs> is. Like I love going there because you know, it, first of all, they're Italian. So they love to do all these wonderful, beautiful things like eat great food and drink lots of wine and take <laughs> long breaks. And so, you know, so it's like we go to Italy, we work on an amp for two hours and then it's like, OK, Greg, we go to eat and then, uh, you know, we do, then we'll, have, we'll have lunch for five hours. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, it's real laid back. And um, I do think I do like the fact that I that I feel like um, I probably have been able to offer things to them because uh uh they 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 made their mark no no pun intended uh as a base company you know as mark base and they i think they they are now 40 percent of the of the market so they're the by far the biggest base amp company in the world um and then as they got into guitar that's a you know the guitar amplifier realm is a is a very different realm it's a different animal a guitar amp is a different machine entirely and it's something that i think in the beginning they were still trying to figure out a little bit but um and i do feel like i was able to come in and 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 be helpful in just having them understand maybe better what guitarists are really looking for so and they've been very open to my suggestions they've been they've welcomed them and they've uh, been very willing to do whatever they can to address my my needs and concerns. Uh, and, and it's still that way to this day. So, uh, it's a great company to work for. And mm-hmm. they're, they're just, it's just, I can't say, you know, I, I go over there, I, I hang out with Marco. We go on his boat, you know, we get, <laughs> we're, we're, you know, he always puts me up at nice hotels on the beach and, uh, it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful relationship. It doesn't hurt. I can't say no, not at <laughs> yeah. all. Yeah. Well, and I think you've always been a fan of tube amps, but, uh, you adopted a solid state amp after this partnership so that says a lot right about the product and about the partnership so yeah that really surprised me i never <laughs> uh, you know 10 years ago if someone had said to me there's a solid state amp that you're going to love i, I would have said i would have just laughed and said no i'm not because there's i know how solid state behaves and it doesn't work under my fingers it just it just doesn't mm-hmm. so it, there's a there's a fundamental quality in that whole technology that just isn't that doesn't work with my fingers. They, my fingers don't like solid state. So whatever they did with this GH little 250 amp, particularly the new one that has a microtube in the preamp stage, it really, really does feel like a tube amp. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how they did it. I have no <laughs> idea how they did it. <laughs> But it's really impressive. And if I had, if you know, if I had to only play this amp, if someone said, well, that's it, you're, not, you're never going to be able to play a tube amp ever again, this is the only amp you can play, I would, I would say, well, okay, that's fine. I would be okay with it. Wow. That says a yeah, lot. It's, it does. Yeah. It's really pretty impressive. Yeah. And guitar-wise, you were an ESP guy for the longest time. Uh, I think you played mm-hmm. tour for a while, and now Kizo, right? Yes, um, yes. I seem to remember you playing a, with a carving model in 2017, but uh, is that essentially the same as the Kizo, or how does that work? Yes. So uh, Carvin um, approached me, I, I think it was, it must have been around 2014 or 15. And uh, they had been, they had been fairly aggressively trying to get me to come on board. I was a little jaded at that time because I had, I had just come out of a relationship with Laguna, which was owned by Guitar Center. Mm-hmm. And that, that the Laguna line was put together by a guy named Keith Brawley, who's a well-known luthier. And I don't remember if he worked as part of the Ibanez or Fender 
custom shop. I don't remember, but it was he, he was well known. Mm-hmm. But then he was working the corporate realm of Guitar Center, and he came out with this line of guitars called um, Laguna. And so they sent me a couple of them in around 2008, maybe 2007. I didn't really care for them, so I sent them back and just said thanks, but no thanks. And then about a year later, they contacted me again and said, what was it that you didn't like about these? Uh, or what would it take to get you on board? And I said, well, a, a guitar that I really like. So I ended up being able to work with Keith and develop what was eventually the LE924, the orange LE924. Yeah. And I felt really good about that guitar. And then almost immediately after that happened and started to get some momentum, uh, the 2008 financial crunch hit and guitar center basically pulled everything out that wasn't tried and proven so they you know they were like we're not going to do this we're not we're not getting behind this laguna thing anymore we're just going to stick with you know roland and fender and and ibanez and gibson and the things that we know we can sell Mm -hmm. so i was pretty i was pretty disappointed after that because i'd really put a lot of effort into that guitar and i felt really good about it i worked closely with uh, Steve Blucher from DiMarzio, we came up with a pickup that was great. Um, so when Carvin at that time was contacting me, I had already in my mind decided I don't want to get with another company. I'm just going to, I have a lot of guitars. I, I'm just, you know, at this point in my career, I doubt that I really need a company for uh, for anything, you know, so I'm just uh-huh. going to be a free agent. But they were, they, you know, every couple of weeks I get another email from them. Like, hey, Greg, you know, we'd love to have you. Hey, Greg, if you ever, you know, so so finally I said, well, why don't you guys send me a guitar and let's see what happens. So they sent me uh, what they called, I think it's discontinued now, but at the time it was called their Bolt Classic, which is essentially uh, like a Stratocaster, but with a, with a carbon headstock. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe it had a, I believe there was a humbucker in the bridge, so like a super strat, but it was so strange because, you know, as you probably know, almost everything that I've played since has been essentially a classic shred guitar, 24 frets, you know, Floyd Rose, flat neck, uh, you know, humbucker yeah. in the bridge. And yeah. um, so what, when they sent me this guitar, which was very much the opposite, you know, standard bridge, uh, 22 frets, um, five way switch. I, I just remember thinking, Hmm, okay, well, let's see, you know, and I started playing it and I just started to fall in love with, with the Strat versatility of it, you know, just the second and fourth position, getting those Hendrix tones, getting, mm-hmm. the, you know, all those different kinds of, uh, you know, different kinds of flavors that other than just aggressive guitar. And, and I said, ah, you know what, guys, I, I like this. This is cool. So when, then, then they asked me if I wanted to do a signature guitar, or actually he wanted me to do a signature guitar. In fact, he, he was really encouraging that. So I said, well, if you're going to do a signature guitar, why don't we just do this mm. with 24 frets? Let's do a 24 fret version of this, and I'll be totally happy. <laughs> um, and so that's how that uh, came about. But at the time, Carbon had three departments, right? They had, and, and I believe that it's the, 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 all the siblings, right? So it's the, it's the sons of uh, Mark Kiesel. Who, Mark Kiesel is the, the father who owns the company. Okay. And I think he actually inherited it from his father. So he was the second generation. And so you had the three sons under him, one handling the, audio, the pro audio department, one handling the amplification, and then the other one handling, Jeff was handling the guitar department. And I believe that Jeff just felt that the guitar end of, the, of Carbon was making the majority of the money and that he was, you know, he had a, in a you know, a very... Uh, you know, you know, um, I guess potent or aggressive sort of online presence with the social media. You know, he's going for it, mm-hmm. really putting it out there. And I, I think he just felt like the other guys aren't really stepping up, stepping up. They're not really holding up. And why should we be splitting all this money evenly if if we're making the majority of if we're the reason for the majority of the income? I, I could be speaking out of turn. Jeff, if you're listening to this, you know, I'm sure that <laughs> you can modify this and correct me. But. I think basically he just felt like we could do we could do better by just breaking away from mm-hmm. the, from Carvin. So they did. <clears throat> they broke away from Carvin, and he just he, they they adopted the name uh, Kiesel, which is the which is the family name. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
he may have been on to something because it was almost immediately afterwards that Carvin uh, went out of business. Oh, <laughs> it seems to me that it seems to me that he may have been right yeah. about his theory. Um, but that's why they became Kiesel because he couldn't keep that name due to the fact that if he was going to break away from Carvin while Carvin was still remaining, obviously he couldn't keep the name Carvin. But yeah, they mm-hmm. that the Kiesel was born out of that company. I understand. And uh, well, last question for me: uh, Are there mm-hmm. any sort of plans for you to release a live album? Because uh, you never had that, and so many years of of, of uh, great studio albums, but no no live album. Oh, we will have one. We will definitely do a live album. Um, that is definitely going to happen. I'm and I'm thinking that on the next tour, which will probably be next year, um, there is a place. There's a company that um, when I was with when I was with uh, Protocol, we actually recorded at this place that did record the whole show, and he did end up releasing releasing that as a live album. They did a really great job recording it. You know, great mics, great mixing board. They had mm-hmm. the facility for a great situation like that. And if we, if I book, if my European tour gets booked, uh, then we may see if we can we can do it there but there's a lot of situations where if 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 the venue knows ahead of time that i intend to record something uh we can make sure that it happens the right way and i i feel like this next tour i want to do that okay right good to know good to know yeah Uh that'd be great well greg it was a pleasure man i wanted to thank you for your time and for so many years of inspiration oh thank you i really appreciate that thanks thank you Okay, everyone, thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this chat with Greg Howe. Don't forget that it's also available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and High Heart Radio. If you can, please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to finish now with the song I Wonder from Greg's latest album, Wheelhouse. Take care, stay safe, and see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,